Hi Grade Nines, Mr. Kleiman here. I'm here again with my helpers. This is Brenda and this is Lizzie. Uh, we're going to try to do a little introduction to you today for not static electricity, but now we're going to go on to current electricity. So last week I had you investigate a little bit about static and that's when we build up electrons in one place or we lose electrons in one place, but those charges are not moving. Uh, so I think of them a little bit like the molecules of water inside of this measuring cup. And while there is a lot of energy stored up right here in this measuring cup, I can't do anything with it while it's just sitting here in the cup. In order to make this do something, I need to get it flowing. And how can I get it flowing? Gravity. Water responds to gravity. But as I'm sure you well know, electrons don't. I can hold a battery upside down all day long and electrons are not going to come running out. They're not going to power your cell phone, they're not going to turn on a light bulb. So the question we need to address today is how can we get electrons flowing like we got this water flowing and allow them to do work? Okay, so one of the most interesting parts of physics is that, you know, to get that energy from this water to get transferred to another object, uh, oftentimes I need to turn that stored up potential energy into the water into the moving energy called kinetic energy. And you can see, uh, so if gravity can make water start to flow, then you know that that flowing water could do things like move a boat or turn a turbine. If gravity can get water uh, doing work, what can make electrons flow and get them to do work. And so what I have in my hands right here uh, is a battery box that works kind of like a battery that you'd put into any device, but I can plug it in and it doesn't ever lose its charge and I can set how strong or weak that battery uh, is. And so this we would call a source. What is it a source of? Well, it's a source of potential energy. This is like moving water up a mountain but instead we're charging up electrons with potential energy using an electrical source. How are we going to get them to flow? Well, the next thing we need, Miss Brenda, is some wires. And let's zoom in nice and close on the wires. Uh, these wires have two different components to them. On the outer surface is a type of plastic. And the reason we coat the wires in plastic is because they're electrical insulators. This means that electrons cannot flow freely through that material, which means that any electrons inside this wire can't get out. And so what's on the inside? Okay, a conductor. In this case, metal. Uh, the ends here uh, are made out of one material that's a little more flexible, but really the majority of this is uh, copper, which is one of the best in, uh, conducting materials uh, in the world that's also incredibly cheap uh, to produce. So we've got these wires now. So I'm going to turn on my battery box. I'm going to connect my wires. And Lizzie, can I have a black wire, please? And that's really all I need in order to start getting electrons to flow. Uh, so far, nothing is flowing through these wires because I have not completed what's called a circuit. The way to get the electrons to move is to make a closed loop of conductors going from the negative terminal where electrons are coming out and coming back to the positive terminal. So if you watch this little green light very closely, as soon as I touch these two wires together, Okay, you can see that that red light turns on and what that means is that electrons are flowing and nothing is using that potential energy. Imagine this like a raging river and every time that water gets back to this box, it speeds up the water even more. And so it goes around faster and faster and faster and this machine is saying, too much electricity, red light, no good. So in order to make this thing do some useful work, Instead of just having a source with connecting wires, let's put what we call a load. And a load is anything that uses that electricity. In this case, I'm going to use a little mini light bulb. So I'm going to connect one side to the negative terminal. That's where the electrons are coming from. 
And I'm going to connect the other side to the positive terminal. That's where the electrons can come back and get a new dose of potential energy. And you can see that as soon as I connect uh, this circuit and close the circuit, okay, the light bulb lights up and it's using that potential energy. If you zoom in nice and close to this dial, you can see exactly how much potential energy I'm putting in. This dial is set to the number six and the units for that is V, which stands for volts. And so six volts is a measure of how much potential energy is going in each little bundle of electrons flowing through the circuit. Have a look at the light bulb. And I'm gonna go from six down to 4.5, down to three, and down to 1.5 volts. Less volts means less potential energy, which means we can do less work. More volts, more potential energy, we can do more and more work. And these little mini light bulbs are only rated to go up to six volts max. So we'll stop there. Okay, so now we've added in one more component to our circuit, and generally this is just for safety and for having a bit of control. And we call it a control device. This particular one is a switch, and Lizzie is gonna show you how that switch works. So Lizzie, can you flip the switch, please? Okay, and as soon as she opens that switch, the light turns off, and when she closes it, the light turns back on. Nice work. And so all she's doing is breaking the circuit. Right now, the electrons can flow from the negative terminal through to the positive terminal. But if we lift that switch, we disconnect them, the circuit is no longer complete and the electrons immediately stop flowing. This is like stopping a raging river in its tracks simply by making a break in that river. This is the beauty of electricity is that we've got so much control. So we've added a couple more components now to our circuit, but fundamentally when I follow these wires, we go from the negative terminal, we go through the switch, and now we go into this device right here, which is called an ammeter. And what this is going to do is it's going to measure the speed that electrons are flowing through the circuit. So they go in here and out there. And we can continue along our wire, we go back into that light bulb, and back out of that light bulb and back to the positive terminal. The last thing that I've added onto this circuit is that on either side of my light bulb, I've connected a different kind of meter. This one isn't integrated as part of a wire. This is measuring the difference in potential energy from this side of the bulb to this side of the bulb. In other words, it's saying how much energy went into this light bulb and now how much energy is coming out of this light bulb. And if we put six volts in, well, we should get exactly six volts out. It's using all six volts of the energy that we're putting into the circuit. But what about our ammeter, which is measuring the speed? Well, right now, we're reading it from that middle scale, zero to 500. That's why I've plugged it into the 500 milliamp section of my ammeter. And we can see that the reading is about 150 milliamps. Now, I don't have control over how many amps are coming out of this box. Each different load is gonna draw its own amount of current from the source, okay? So this particular little light bulb draws exactly 1.5 milliamps of current from the source. If I put six volts of energy in, it's gonna use all six volts of energy out. Speed is the current, potential energy is the voltage. All right, so now the next obvious question is, uh, how can we add more than one load to this circuit? And further, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say what happens to the current and the voltage when we add more loads. Now there's actually two different ways that I can add in another load. The first and maybe simplest way that I can show you is wiring it in what we call series. So here's that original bulb that we had wired in at the start. Here's the new one that I wanna add in, and I'm gonna add it to the exact same path that we originally had for just that one bulb. Negative terminal into the switch, switch into the load, and then load 
directly into the second load, back to the source. And you can see that these bulbs are glowing a little bit dimmer when you have two bulbs on. Okay, I'll show you that uh, one more time. I'm gonna disconnect the second bulb, brighter, and reconnect the second bulb a little bit dimmer. And that's because every electron needs to go through not one, but now two loads. And it's gonna share its voltage between the two. We'll bring back the voltmeter at the end and measure it, but we're expecting to see six volts going in total, three volts here, and three volts here if these two loads are identical. If the loads were different, if this one used one, we would expect to see five being used over here, if this one used two, we'd expect to see four volts being used over here. Mm. But let me show you another way that I can wire in this second load. What if we connected just our one light bulb over here like we did at the start, but for my second load, I'm gonna give the electrons a choice. Need one more black wire. Okay. At this spot, when the electrons are coming here, I'm going to say that they can either go into this load or give them a parallel path. What if you go this way into a second load? And then back here and back to the source. When you look at it this way, we say that these are two parallel circuits. One circuit here and another circuit here. Notice that both of the bulbs hold their brightness. If this one gets six volts, so does this. Electrons can either go this way and deliver all six volts, or they go this way and deliver their six volts back to the source, get more energy, and do it again. Okay? So let's take some measurements from this circuit. So here's my voltmeter, which is going to measure the amount of potential energy that's going through each load. I'll turn that to you. And when I touch it to the negative and the positive terminal, you can see that this light bulb is using 6 volts, and this light bulb is using 6 volts. If I wire them in series, this light bulb is using 3 volts, and the other light bulb is using 3 volts. So in series, the voltage is split between the loads. In parallel, each load gets the exact same voltage. And our last step is to look at the current. What about the current? How fast are electrons going? And this one takes maybe a little bit more thinking, but is a really interesting outcome. So when we had just one load, Okay, just a single light bulb. I hope you remember that that load was drawing 150 milliamps of current from the source. And now that we have two loads, you might expect that it would be drawing more current, but if you look closely, we've gone from 150 milliamps down to like maybe 100 around that. Less current. And that's because if you think of this like traffic on a road, there's more traffic. Each one of these loads is providing resistance for the electrons and it's slowing them down. Slow down here, and then slow down again here. If we look at wiring them in parallel, we're offering not a single road for electrons to go down. We're offering two separate parallel roads. You can drive on Bathurst, or you can drive on Young Street. So here we'll give it the option to go the other way. Okay. 
So now we're going to read the total current coming out of our source when they're wired in parallel. And when we have two different paths for the electrons to follow, you can see we're up to about 300 milliamps. Now this thing isn't calibrated perfectly, but that's 300 milliamps, which means that light bulb number one is drawing 150 milliamps, and then light bulb two is drawing its own 150 milliamps. You've got two separate roads for the electrons to travel down, and so you can split the traffic bet between each road. Uh, any given electron doesn't have to go through both loads, it only needs to go through one. There's only 150 milliamps of current going here, and another 150 milliamps of current over there. We can show that 150 milliamps down each path by moving our ammeter. So now we can just move our ammeter to that uh, second part of the circuit after this choice, and we can see how much current is going down that second path. So we've got one circuit that's currently on. This second circuit that's currently off, I'm going to put an ammeter on it, connect it. And right away you can see that electrons can now flow down just that second path, and here you can see we've got another 150 milliamps. So it's 150 milliamps on this path, 150 milliamps on this path, and combined that's 300 milliamps. The last thing that I want to show you is that I can swap out that ammeter for now that switch, and you can see that I can control just one part of my circuit. Okay, that means that I can still allow electrons to flow down this path, but I can have separate control down this path. In series, everything is on or everything is off, but in parallel, uh, we have individual control over each load. So you can imagine this is how you wire your house. Each one of the switches in your house controls a separate parallel circuit. When you turn it on, it's going to have the full amount of voltage, 120 volts is what comes out of our electrical sockets in North America. And you can turn on whatever you want and turn off whatever you want. They all got the same voltage. The danger here is that every time I add another load in parallel, I draw even more current, more and more electrons from the source. Each electron still has the same voltage, 120 volts, but I draw more and more and more each time we add a load. This is one of the biggest fire hazards in our house is that we have too many loads on at the same time. So before I let you go, I just want to show you how we can actually represent any circuit uh, in two dimensions on a piece of paper. And this is going to be your first main assignment is to start drawing what we call circuit diagrams. And what you see on the screen are agreed upon symbols that all scientists and electricians will use when trying to describe an electrical circuit on paper. They'll use lines for wires, this symbol here for a load, which is anything that uses electricity, a resistor that can slow down electrons, an ammeter that can measure amps or the speed that electrons are flowing through a circuit, a voltmeter that reads uh, volts, which is the potential difference, the difference of potential energy from one point to another. A cell, which is uh, what you would think of a, as a battery, but it's uh, a battery that only produces 1.5 volts. And then here you can see one, two, three cells stacked together. That's 1.53, then 4.5 volts. And we use that same symbol for anything that produces 4.5 volts or more. We'll call that one officially a battery. If it only makes 1.5 volts, we call it a cell. And a couple more things are our little control devices over here. And this is how we show a switch that's open, meaning that the circuit is off. And here's how we draw a switch that's closed, meaning that the circuit is on. This fancy thing here is a fuse. And if we have a short circuit, that's a circuit with no load in it. Uh, wires will get super hot this little filament here will melt and break the circuit to prevent a fire in your house. Uh, for any circuit that I ask you to draw, if there's a switch present, please draw it open. Uh, even if you want your circuit to be on, we're going to draw the open switch because it's much easier to see it and find it rather than this one right here. And so let's have a look. 
some basic circuits. So maybe this is the circuit that you've built. You got a battery, a switch, and a load. We can turn that into a circuit diagram. There's our battery. There's our basic circuit in wires. I've added my switch followed by my load. And notice that I use 90 degree turns okay, to keep it nice and neat and organized. We try to make it as with as few twists and turns as possible. Even though you see that the real wire does a lot of kinks and bends, we're looking for simplicity in a circuit diagram. I could have absolutely moved this over here as well. It doesn't matter where exactly on the wire it goes. It's just important that things are connected in the right order. Positive terminal, positive terminal. First thing out of the positive terminal is a switch. First thing out of the positive terminal is a switch. Switch to load, load to source. Switch to load, load to source. Okay, so I could have moved this. Uh, load up here or down here and it wouldn't make a difference so long as it didn't come before that switch. Let's look at a slightly more complicated circuit and here you've got uh, no, I didn't animate that particularly well I'll just reveal the whole thing here but here we've got uh, our source there we've got our ammeter in integrated into the circuit followed by a load followed by our switch and on either side connected before and after this load, before and after we've got our voltmeter. Uh, and I could have of course made this wire connect all the way up here and all the way down here if I wanted to, but I like showing that if the voltmeter is reading the potential difference across this load here and here, I want it to just be attached here and here. Uh, it wouldn't be incorrect though, uh, so long uh, if I had attached it here and here, uh, so long as the order in which the components are connected is correct. And so here are those basic circuit types, right? Here you can see two loads that are wired in series. There's a single path for the electrons to follow. And here you can see two loads wired in parallel. The electrons can go either this way or that way. Uh, let's look at this circuit here. We've got two loads. You can see that they're wired in series relative to each other. Here now I've added in an ammeter, that's part of the wire measuring the speed of electrons at this point. And here I've got a voltmeter okay, measuring the potential difference from here to here. In other words, how many volts is this load using? I can move components around. I can measure the voltage across uh, this load. I could even measure the voltage across the source. Okay. Uh, but let's say that I had set it up in such a way that I had one voltmeter reading the total voltage coming out of the source. And I was trying to measure how many volts are being used by this load and how many are being used by this load. Remember that fundamental rule. We said that in series, uh, one bundle of electrons is going to need to go through this and then this load, which means it needs to share the amount of energy it got from the source. V1 plus V2 must add up to that total voltage in series. Okay. The ammeter, however, I can put it anywhere here or here. It doesn't really make a difference because if there's only one path for electrons to follow, they must be going the same speed no matter where they are on that track. They can't pass each other on that track. So in series, the current is always constant, but the voltage gets split. Okay, here we have a parallel circuit. And this time, okay, if we've got an ammeter over here, but we have split into two separate roads, well, we can also split the current. This ammeter is not going to read the same as this. Remember, we had our 300 milliamps here, but only 150 milliamps over here. Okay, the current will split down each parallel path. So if I add yet another uh, load to this parallel circuit, you know, here we're going to have some uh, electrons go this way, and then even some further will continue on this way. And so in general, A1 plus A2 has got to add up to the total current that's coming out of the source right here. Okay. And we can keep adding you know, A3, A4, A5. So in parallel, the current down each individual path must add up to the total current coming from the source. If I had had a voltmeter on each one of these, remember it doesn't matter which way an electron goes, 
it's still going to carry the same amount of energy. So if I had six volts here, those six volts can be delivered either here or here or here for any given electron, which means that this is going to read six volts and this will read six volts and this will read six volts. Um, they'll all get the same voltage, okay, but draw their own current down their own path. And that's it for today. Thanks very much.